Where we left off in our last lecture, we were discussing the Thirty Years' War, and the Thirty Years' War as the culmination of, you know, really over a century of religious conflicts that, that really ravaged Europe following the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation, of course, began uh, particularly with the 95 Theses of Martin Luther in 1519. Though there were longer-term causes to the Protestant Reformation, um, the Avignon uh, Captivity or the Great Schism uh, during the 1300s, the Black Death, of course, Johannes Gutenberg's printing press, the indulgence crisis surrounding the building of the Basilica at St. Peter's, leading reformers to apply what they could now understand about a, a Bible that was translated in their spoken tongue, apply critical analysis to the Bible, and this leads to the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation, of course, results in widespread conflict um, across Europe, particularly in the Holy Roman Empire, which you see here. And, of course, we know it culminates in the Thirty Years' War, a devastating conflict that was waged in, in areas of today, make up areas like Germany and Austria and, and so forth today, a devastating conflict in which we saw larger armies, better trained armies, uh, using gunpowder weapons. And the results of this were really, really massive casualties in many cases. As we know, and as this map points out, ultimately, the war which began, this Thirty Years War, began as a conflict of, um, of militant Catholicism against militant Protestantism. But eventually it just became a conflict of self-interest. The various powers that were involved in either physically fighting in the war or supplying those fighting in the war became involved really just to, to benefit their own self-interest, to seize territory, to sow discord. When the Peace of Westphalia is created at the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, the general goal here was to create a balance of power and to end the sort of almost seemingly constant violence of, of, of the post-Protestant Reformation period. And so what they did is they created this diplomatic grouping created boundaries for new countries. It recognized the sovereign rights of countries to exist. It generally condemned self-interested war and allowed countries a right. This new redrawn map of Europe allowed countries the right to a greater level of self-determination in terms of governing their own affairs. A consequence of this, it's a, not an intentional consequence, but a consequence of this is now you have nation states that have their territorial borders, at least from a diplomatic, internationally like legal system, recognized and protected, and they have a right to determine their own affairs. A consequence of this is now uh, nation states have the ability to create alliances with other countries, and they have a greater ability to oversee their own sort of governance in maintaining a sort of status quo, a balance of power in Europe. The result of this are the creation of new states, and typically states in which governments were aligned with uh, certain religious groups. So in places like Sweden, you have Lutheranism. In England, you have the Anglican Church. In France, you have the Catholic Church. Now, these are not theocracies. The religion is not the government. They're actually, um, they're actually states run by, um, run by their, their parliamentary monarchy or an absolute monarchy in the case of a place like France or in Prussia, largely through a, a more of a military type state. But in many of these states, the religion becomes a formally acknowledged state religion. Now, oftentimes there's an embrace, em, embrace of other types of religious denominations that can exist, but by and large, states have state religions. They're not theocracies, but they have state-sanctioned religions. 
my point with this, the Thirty Years' War gives rise to new types of independent governments. Really, for the first time, you see an era in history where governments are not beholden necessarily to an outside power uh, like the Holy Roman Empire and the Papacy. You s instead see the emergence of independent states that have a much greater ability to control their own affairs than before. And this is very much fundamental to creating effectively the international system of nation states. In England, you had the development of a limited monarchy ultimately, though there were attempts at absolutism in England. In the Dutch Republic, you see more of a small level independent republic developed. And in France, you see an absolute monarchy led by the monarch Louis XIV. England's a little bit unique at this time. Again, this is uh, the post-Protestant Reformation period. You start to see the emergence of new types of states, states that are secular, states that are, that while aligned with churches or a religious denomination, are free of the outside influence of the papacy or the Holy Roman Empire. They are independent states now in um, a European sort of international system designed to maintain a balance of power between these various nation states. And subsequently, the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War, though Henry VIII is before that, does result in a period of time with um, far more peace than the 130 years post-Protestant Reformation. It is a more peaceful time, but it's also a time period in which you see the rich and the powerful uh, really expand their wealth to, to, to quite unimaginable levels. So you see an increased stratification of society. The rich get much richer, and whereas in many cases like in, uh, in France, the everyday people, um, their lot tends to get worse. But there's a balance of power, and so there's less conflict too. England develops as a secular limited monarchy under the under the reign of Henry VIII, the Tudor king, who you see pictured here. Henry VIII, of course, um, many of you I'm sure know the story of Henry VIII. He formed the Anglican Church, which was the Church of England, and it was separated from the papacy. Why did he do this? It was really for matters of power. He um, he was obsessed with having a male heir. He believed his wife who was Catherine of Aragon. Aragon is Spain. Of course, that's very much the heart of the ruling uh, monarchies of the Holy Roman Empire. And so divorcing basically um, a, a member of the royal family that is inherently connected to the papacy was a very, very significant thing to do. In these times, in order to have a divorce, you had to have an acknowledgement uh, from the papacy that it was okay. And the papacy refused to give Henry VIII a divorce. He, Henry VIII accused Catherine of Aragon uh, of, of all kinds of, of things to try to justify this. In reality, he was just you know, angry because he blamed Catherine for not providing a male heir. In truth... Reproductive science of the 21st century tells us it was actually mu probably much more down to Henry VIII and not his wife. But nonetheless, this is a very patriarchal society. He wants to divorce his wife um, so that he can pursue a new partner um, who might provide him with a male heir. The Catholic Church refused it, and so eventually he will split the English crown from the Catholic Church by, by finding individuals that worked in the English Catholic Church who would side with him and agree to annul the marriage, grant him a divorce, and effectively break with the Catholic Church, which is what happens. And it's a very critical moment um, in which a secular monarchy effectively broke from the papacy, and over the long term, uh, becomes independent of the papacy. And this, of course, becomes formally the case across Europe following the Peace of Westphalia. Henry VIII, of course, was, was married a number of times. He executed um, many of his wives. Catherine was not executed. She was sort of um, imprisoned uh, where, she would, where she would die. Uh, 
Um, he only he only got one male heir, and that was Edward. And Edward uh, the sixth was was not very healthy, and he did not he did not live a long life. And his time as king was very brief. Um, his heir that actually was the most significant was actually Queen Elizabeth, who was the most significant monarch probably of the post Tudor period associated with the founding of the British Navy and really beginning uh, England's like ascension to uh, influence in the global scene. In the 1600s, you had the English Civil War. And uh, this was a period, as the 30, 30 Years' War was going on, uh, you saw fights over the power of the monarch. And the, the, the monarch was refusing to call parliament uh, for, for measures of taxation. And this leads to a myriad of conflicts in which um, you had kings, Charles I, being overthrown. Uh, you had Oliver Cromwell, the Puritan um, sort of uh, military figure who rises to power in the English Civil War. Eventually, he's overthrown. Charles II comes back to the throne, and anyway, by the end of the century, with with an event known as the Glorious Revolution of 1688, when James II, who also would be overthrown in this event, overthrown by William of Orange, the Dutch figure, and James II's um, daughter, William and Mary, come to England, take the throne, and begin the formation, acknowledgement of the English Bill of Rights, which is one of the first of its kind. And so this is very much in line with developments going back to the Magna Carta about the development of greater individual representation, individual liberty and rights. The English Bill of Rights particularly uh, related largely to uh, people's rights when it comes to law, uh, jurisprudence, courts, and legal affairs. And it's, it's very much influential in a document that comes to be about a hundred years later in the United States and its Bill of Rights. So England goes through a process whereby you had this separation from the papacy, the formation of the Anglican Church. Henry VIII very much seeking to be more of an absolute monarch, but ultimately we see during the 1600s the development of the process increasingly of a more limited and secular parliamentary monarchy. The case of absolutism is found most in France, um, though we have other cases of it like Peter the Great in Russia, the Romanov Tsar. So the formation of absolute monarchy really takes hold under the leadership of Louis the 14th, who you see in this painting here, it's known as the Sun King. Absolute monarch means that the monarch ultimately has um, more or less supreme authority, whereas in England, um, Parliament really had, um, especially by the end of the 1600s, when the, when the Act of Parliamentary Supremacy was signed, Parliament really was the most significant factor. In England, France has a, a, a parliament of some kind. It's called the Estates General. But the Estates General is really never convened, and it's a very, very poorly representative body. So the absolute monarchy effectively has a level of absolute control. But absolute monarchs still need people to raise taxes. They need people to carry out orders and wishes of the king. The period of the rise of the absolute monarchs following the Thirty Years' War is an incredibly ostentatious period. Uh, and you see Louis the Fourteenth here, pictured here uh, very much gives you that sense of the sort of extravagance of this age. This age is sometimes called the Baroque Age. And it's called that because as we see the formation of now these, 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 these countries that have a reasonable amount of, of certainty that uh, 
a balance of power will be maintained in Europe, that their borders are protected and sovereign, that they have a right to determine the nature of their own governing affairs. Uh, the offshoot of that is that we start to see less conflict, but you also see you also see a sort of consolidation in wealth at the top. Uh, in countries like France, for example, building of massive, massive structures and palaces, uh, all kinds of ostentatious forms of spending during this time period, all of which, by the way, sowed the seeds for the eventual coming of the French Revolution. For the most part, most of the conflicts during this period of time were actually conflicts that Louis XIV began out of an attempt to expand the authority of the French state. By and large, these uh, these plans, these, these wars were unsuccessful. These were wars like the War of Spanish Succession, for example. Uh, but they were largely designed uh, for Louis to expand the power of the state. But by and large, it's a period of greater peace. And likewise, it's a period in which extreme wealth is consolidated at the top at, at a level really unheard of in European affairs. There's also a growth in standing militaries during this time period. It's not uncommon for the military to be seen policing palaces now, policing various state buildings to be seen on demonstrations and so forth uh, throughout um, uh, the monarchy. You have the building of theaters, lecture halls, museums, massive palaces. And it puts on very much this idea of tremendous power and wealth of the state but it kind of covers up the reality. And the reality is that the masses of people in a country like France were hugely overtaxed and in a situation uh, that for them had probably deteriorated, whereas the wealthy situation had become, uh, if you will, uh, more so. Louis XIV, when he was very young, he was like 10 years old, there was, a, there was an uprising. Um, of wealthy elites who sought to rise up against against the French government because of an attempt to raise taxes on them. The elites in France paid no taxes, and of course, uh, that attempt failed. But as a result of that, Louis XIV was very, very fearful of other elites in society rising up against him. And so he created an elaborate way of understanding how to deal with the other potential enemies in his state. And the way he does this is particularly through the building of the palace at Versailles. Versailles is a massively huge palace. I'm going to show you some pictures that I took in just a moment. Versailles is located about 12 miles from, France, from Paris, uh, from the capital. And the capital where Louis XIV was originally at was actually the Louvre, which today, of course, is the most impressive art museum in the world. And it is massive. The Louvre is one of the most incomprehensible uh, in size buildings you'll, you'll ever visit. It's incredibly huge. Seeing everything in the Louvre would take weeks um, if you tried to do so. So that was the, 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 the place of the, 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 the head of state, if you will. But Louis was very concerned of uprisings, and there were oftentimes tensions and rebellions in Paris. And so he built this palace at Versailles, some 12 miles away, you know, in a small town that was about a thousand people at the time. And he built it on the site of an old hunting cabin, hunting lodge. And he builds this massive palace. And in the palace, he effectively makes all of the nobles, he gives them jobs, and effectively makes them all live at the palace. And the palace has some 700 rooms, to give you an idea. And this allowed Louis to keep an eye on all of his potential enemies. In addition to this, Louis created a sort of ostentatious um, sort of society that demanded that other members of French society effectively um, adorn themselves with splendor and excessive sort of tastes, whether paintings or clothing or the carriages that you might ride in. And so the age, this Baroque age, then becomes largely because Louis' leadership encourages it through Versailles and other forms of, of communication, um, 
it really encourages people to live beyond their means, whether they're wealthy noblemen or more everyday people that are not in the class of aristocrats and nobles. And so it creates, this period of time in France creates a, a sort of a sort of theme across France of living beyond your means. So the state on a personal level, on a state level, was ultimately massively in debt. Now Louis XIV was a very strong leader. He lived, he lived for a long time. He was a very strong leader. But after he, he dies, when he's no longer the monarch, you will see France increasingly be pressured by the problems of the sort of ostentatious excesses of the Baroque age, and likewise, um, the massive debt held by the state and by the people, and all in a time period when the wealthiest people paid no taxes. So the nobles, the aristocrats, the church paid no taxes in France at the time. And it's that fact, sort of a direct offshoot of of uh, the age, the Baroque age, a direct offshoot of the Thirty Years' War, led directly to the French Revolution of, 16, of 1789, one of the most transformative moments in, uh, in Western civilization. The Palace of Versailles is massive. Uh, now, I obviously did not take this picture, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of just how massive this palace is. Again, you're talking about some 700 uh, different rooms. Uh, it has an opera hall. It is incredibly impressive. It's ordained with, with, with chandeliers, with paintings. But the interesting thing about Versailles, again, this was built by Louis to demonstrate his power it's incredible. It's incredible size. It's incredible excess. It's meant to demonstrate Louis's power. It's also designed to control other powerful figures in the state, to control other noblemen. Because if you could control them by keeping an eye on them, by keeping them in debt, by keeping them effectively owed to the uh, the gifts of the monarch, when you are in debt from excessive your excessive lifestyle that Louis encourages, you constantly are kind of reaching out to the monarch for aid and support. So the Palace of Versailles functions as a vehicle of absolutism, if that makes sense. Within this palace, and this is kind of the opening courtyard, and up here on this side is where the private apartments for the monarchy were at. So sometimes you could a monarch and their family could reside up here. And if you ever go to Versailles, I highly recommend that when you go in there, get the, 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 you know, the 25 euro ticket or something to tour the private apartments. And the reason I say that is because Versailles is a, is a place that is swamped with tourists, not surprisingly. But when you get the, the tour of the, of the apartments, uh, you can actually have a tour where there's very, very, very few people around and it's, it's pretty neat. But the reason I say that those are where the private apartments is, is because we have to understand that because this is a function of absolutism, because it's a place where Louis is sort of keeping an eye on his potential competitors, it's an incredibly not private place. Louis used to have servants who worked for him that basically monitored the ongoings all over the palace at all times. There were, you know, peepholes and rooms that you could have. There were secret passages. So you were kind of always being watched. And then Lou would be informed about this. Um, and this allows Louis to understand, you know, what's going on, who his potential enemies were. So it's an incredibly, uh, an incredibly excessive and ostentatious uh, sort of symbol of the Baroque age but also of the manner in which absolutism functioned. This is the clock for Louis XV, and uh, this is in the private apartments. And uh, the clock is actually designed to run. Uh, it's still running. I can't remember. Maybe a thousand years. It's it's designed to continually run. And not only he Louis XV, who was much more withdrawn than Louis XIV, but Louis XV loved machines and and and, and if you will. 
uh, technology of the age. And this clock is designed to continually run and also to not only track the time, but to track major celestial events, eclipses, alignments, and so forth. These are private apartments. And again, these are just the private apartments. And so in the private apartments, you can even yet again see just how excessive and ostentatious every aspect of this palace is. And these are just the, the, the private apartments. They're actually not um, what people come to really see at Versailles. This is the royal commode. This is would be where the king in the private apartment would um, do his business. Another example of some of the meeting rooms in the private apartments area, uh, rooms like this would have been rooms where the diplomats of the American Revolution would have met Louis the Sixteenth. Um, as ironic as it was, the American Revolution, a revolution that created a representative republic, was actually only successful because individuals like Benjamin Franklin were able to create an alliance with an absolute monarchy of Louis the Sixteenth, the last of, well, the last before the French Revolution. The monarchy would be brought back after Napoleon. These images, this is what, and you can see how many tourists are in here. These are the types of images. These are the, the things that people really come um, to see at Versailles. Um, this is called the Hall of Mirrors, the chandeliers, the paintings all over the ceiling, the gold, uh, a truly, truly tremendous sort of place to visit um, and to see. And it's meant to be, again, this was a place where Louis exerted absolute, absolute power um, in a very overwhelming way. Uh, it's where he kept his eye on people, um, other nobles who were potential competitors, potential enemies. He would give them jobs. He would encourage them to live to excess and beyond their means, which caused them to rely on the monarchy more. Uh, this was a theme that became overwhelming in French society during the Baroque period. And the consequence of this was massive debted indebtedness on a national and an individual level in France, which of course um, sets France up for the French Revolution.